Director of the Working Women's Centre South Australia. Uh, tonight I'm going to be your facilitator. We have a really great panel um, ahead of us uh, and we're working with the Reclaim the Night Committee. So we're so excited to present to you the Reclaim the Workplace. Um, I want to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land of which I am located and that is the traditional country of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains. I pay my respects to elders past and present and I acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded. For those who are not aware, the Working Women's Centre is a not-for-profit organisation that provides free industrial information, advice and representation to vulnerable non-unionised workers with workplace issues. The centre is also engaged in research, education and training and in our 41st year of operation, we've been around since 1979, we have a strong history of being at the forefront of law reform and social change for working women. Um, this is the centre's fifth webinar in 2020 um, and all of our sessions have been recorded. Tonight's will also be recorded. We're on Facebook Live um, and you'll be able to find the recording on our website wwcsa.org.au um, in probably in the next few days. So as I said before, tonight we're teaming up with the Reclaim the Night Committee and I thought it was a good moment to maybe give you a bit of background about Reclaim the Night. Um, so the movement in a nutshell, um, it's a global movement and it's historically been an expression of collective fight back against rape, intimidation and abuse, raising women's private experiences into demands on state and federal governments to place responsibility on perpetrators, acknowledge the extent of sexual assault on women and provide adequate services and funding for survivors. Um, in most cities around the world, there's a Reclaim the Night March, a rally, um, and that generally happens at the end of October, of course, because of COVID-19. We haven't had a rally this year in South Australia. And I think, um, uh, I think maybe apart from Brisbane, most of the other jurisdictions of states and territories are the same. So we thought what better to do in a COVID era than have another webinar. Um, so in, spirit of, in the spirit of Reclaim the Night, let's get into it. Um, and now our first speaker is Connie Benares, and she has just joined us, but hasn't quite got her um, camera on. So I might give her a few seconds oh. to do that. Are you there, Connie? I am, but I'm... Can you just give me one tip? Yeah, you go for it and I'll read your bio. Um, so Connie was elected to the Legislative Council in South Australia at, in, at, at the 2018 state election after working with her uh, the party... SA Best and in particular Nick Xenophon, the founder of that party for close to 12 years. She graduated from the University of Adelaide in laws with honours before being admitted to legal practice in 2003. She also holds a Bachelor of Arts majoring in modern Greek and social politics. Um, Connie has been has worked as a practicing lawyer and is a key senior advisor and was a key senior advisor at both state and federal levels of a par parliament before being elected um, in 2018. So welcome, Connie. How are you going with that video? Um, very good. Clearly, I'm, I'm a little bit challenged when it comes to these things. And <laughs> I have been sitting there waiting for the last 15 minutes trying to make sure that I'm more organised. And now it's doing something. So can you just bear with me for one? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I might in the meantime, just let everyone know that there is a chat function. So it'd be really cool if you could chuck in your any questions that you might have. Um, or anything that you might want to um, add or, you know, comment, um, or if you want us to raise anything in particular with the panellists, that would be good. We are definitely keeping an eye on it. Hi, Connie, how are you? That's, that's good. <laughs> are you there? Great. Thanks, Connie. Um, Okay, so look, let's get straight into a couple of questions for you. Um, we, I mean, tonight we're really talking about power and gender and work. Um, and I thought it would be fitting to start with you because as you know, I mentioned in your bio, um, you're an elected parliamentarian and you are also one of the most powerful women in South Australia. And yet you've also been a victim of sexual harassment in your own workplace. That is the workplace um, that it, a parliament house, um, which I think many of us um, would have thought would be unexpected. Um, so look, a bit of background for the audience. Um, uh, Connie was 
was allegedly sexually harassed by a fellow parliamentarian, and I say allegedly because it is currently before the courts. Um, so Connie won't be talking about the specifics of that incident, um, but she is going to be talking about her experiences um, pre and post. Um, and so hopefully if you can just be a little respectful um, of that uh, judicial process in the chat, um, then we'll, um, we'll, but we'll still ask some pretty interesting questions. So um, Connie, I know that um, you really, um, call, really called out the behaviour of your co-worker um, and I'm wondering um, whether that was difficult for you and why you decided to do it because we know that calling out this sort of behaviour in many workplaces is uh, really difficult and sometimes very quite impossible for women. So was it difficult for you and why did you decide to do it? Okay, I think Connie's gone now. So, I don't know if she's back. Yeah. Are you there, Connie? Hello. Hi, Connie. Um, did you get any of that? No, I didn't. And I'm really sorry. What, what, okay, that's all right. I'll just, um, I've given a bit of an intro into I got that. your bio. Yeah. So, um, I and I said I was talking about how difficult it is for women to call out sexual harassment um, and to demand a consequence of their perpetrator. And I'm wondering, particularly given your um, your job as a parliamentarian, what, was it difficult for you, and why did you decide to call it out? Uh, thanks, Abby, and I'm really sorry. I've been trying to be organised for tonight, and 15 minutes of uh, organisation on my part didn't get me very far. So, um, thank fine. you very much for having me. Um, it was very difficult um, and it was difficult both, both personally and professional. Um, but I think you reach a point in, in your career, in your working life, um, where you have to draw a line in the sand and say, I'm not willing to tolerate certain behaviours. Um, and as a member of parliament, um, you really have to question whether you are um, willing to tolerate, you know, levels of arrogance and entitlement that exist in this profession um, and, and what comes along with that. Um, and so even though I can't comment on the specifics of, of my matter, um, I can say that um, I drew that line in the sand. Um, it was extremely difficult. It was above all really deeply humiliating. Um, for about six weeks, I can't think of a single day where I didn't see my face on social media, on the news, um, you know, in in the print um, media um, and for my part it was all for all the wrong reasons because I didn't ask for any of it um, I didn't leak anything to the media um, I wasn't responsible for anyone finding out um, and I thought I would be going through you know whatever appropriate channels um, were available to me um, but it got to a stage where obviously that was no longer possible um, so yes, it was extremely difficult. We all have families, you know, I have a little boy um, who's four and a half and he goes to school and you don't want to be walking through the school yard as the mum who has been involved in one of these incidents. It, it, there is a lot of um, blaming uh, that's involved in these sorts of um, cases. Um, so yes, the short answer is yes. Um, I couldn't go to work functions for a long time. Um, I, there are lots of things that I just couldn't do because the the media frenzy in and of itself was enough to put you off. And to be frank, and I have to say this because I don't blame the media for the level of attention that they gave these events. Um, because the reality is that they knew, and they, you know, when when I did speak to them and explain to them, look, I don't want to talk, you know, publicly about this. Um, they thought it was really important to do because they said this, you know, we'd never get away with this in our workplace. And, and yet it's happening in Parliament House and, and you know, we, people are getting away with it. So yes, it was extremely difficult. Yeah, and I, it's interesting that you talk about sort of drawing a line in the sand. And I'm wondering, you know, is this the first time in your career that you have, is now, is now the time that you've drawn the line in the sand or did that happen, um, you know, a little while ago for you? When, when was the line in the sand drawn? I think, I think the, the line was drawn now um, because frankly, um, you know, this wasn't the first time anything had happened to me. Um, it certainly wasn't the worst thing that had ever happened to me. Um, but there was a big difference between now and previously. Um, because you were talking about your peers and you're talking about 
you know, your, your, your equals in here um, and behaviour that you're exposed to in front of other members of parliament and in front of staff who work at Parliament House. Um, and there is a huge power imbalance between those staff members of, and members of parliament already. Um, and so I, I think, you know, what really, what really focused my mind um, was a couple of discussions I had with staff. And this is impartial staff. So they don't work for political parties. They have no political affiliations. We've got lots of people who work in this building, um, you know, as researchers and uh, we've got catering, we've got security. There's lots of different groups of um, people. Um, but one particular conversation that I had with one of them um, really focused my mind. And that was, you know, the next time I need to get on my feet in that chamber um, and talk about calling out this sort of behaviour, uh, not condoning this sort of behaviour, how much of a hypocrite would I be if I knew that it had been happening in Parliament House to other women and they knew that I knew, um, they knew that I knew it happened to them and I did nothing about it. Mm. And that really, really, uh, from that point on, I was like, right, well, as uncomfortable um, as personally distressing um, as this may be, um, I don't have a choice. And so that's what I did. Yeah. Um, and, and we have to remember, Abby, this is where we work. This is where we spend the majority of our time. Um, I spend most of my time here. The staff in here spend most of their time here. Um, they have every right to feel like they can come to this workplace and feel safe um, and deserve to be treated with respect. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think um, it, the, when, you, when you talk about, you know, rising to your feet, I mean, it's only, it's only what, October 2020, so not too much longer, uh, longer after that you rose and um, you called for an inquiry into the judiciary, an inquiry into sexual harassment into the judiciary and the legal profession. And I know um, that you're a former lawyer and this is a matter that's close to your heart, but... Why is it, do you think, that the legal profession um, and, and industry, you know, it's not just people who are practising, but people who work within the industry, why do you think the profession deserves special attention that is an, an inquiry just into the legal profession? Yeah, and that's a really good question because we know that this happens across the board and particularly it happens in other professions like, you know, the medical profession and whatnot. Um, you, you, when you become a member of a profession, you sign up to, ver to certain standards. You are, there's an expectation that because of the level of training and skills um, that you have and the services that you will deliver, you will be held to a higher standard. And, and you sign up to, uh, to codes of conduct, to um, codes of ethics, and you're required to comply with those. Um, and I think, you know, out of all of us, if anyone is supposed to know what appropriate and inappropriate behaviour in the workplace is, then it's our legislators, our lawmakers, those people who interpret the laws, those people who apply the laws, um, and yet they seem to be the worst offenders. Um, the legal profession has existed in this, in this vacuum where sexual predation has just been deemed okay. Um, you put up with it if you want to progress. Um, there are huge power imbalances that exist from the graduate level down. Um, and and we, don't, we don't talk about it. We don't do anything. We just accept it as part of the culture, as part of the boys' club that also exists in Parliament um, and for members of Parliament. And so I think um, we do need to start with that profession. Absolutely we do. Because, after all, they're the ones who are making laws, applying laws, interpreting laws, um, and they should know better. There are no excuses. We wouldn't get away with this in any other workplace. I'd hasten to say that workplaces that don't have that level of um, responsibility attached to their professionals probably do a better job than we do. Um, and I think the other thing, just following on from that, is we know that, you know, 40% of women leave the legal profession. One in three choose, is considering leaving in the next three years. Um, two complaints to the Equal Opportunity Commissioner in the last five years, I think it is. Two complaints from the legal profession. But I would struggle to find one single female lawyer that I know or someone working in the legal profession has, that has not been, this, you know, subjected to some form of... Um, sexual harassment throughout the course of her career. I know I was. I know, you know, my first interview involved, um, my one of my very first interviews um, after uni um, involved a, 
a solicitor who sexually harassed me in his office. I did nothing about it other than say I wouldn't go and work with him again. Um, so the numbers don't stack up. We know that this exists. Um, the numbers of complaints don't stack up. The reasons why women are leaving the profession in droves don't stack up. You know, most profession, um, most graduates coming out of university are female, um, and yet they're the ones who are foregoing a career in the law, um, and there has to be reasons for that. And this is absolutely part of that reason. Yeah. And that's, um, I guess my next question for you, Connie, is really on that subject is uh, it's what well, you're, you can't be fired um, and no one can stop you from speaking. So when you were thinking about, you know, calling out the behavior, when you were thinking about going down this path, did you have in mind the women who don't have the capital, the social or economic capital to call behaviour out? And, and do you think there is, and did that influence your decision to call it out? Yeah, and, and you're quite right. Politicians have, you know, levels of privilege um, afforded to them that ordinary workers don't have afforded to them. Um, so we are in a very fortunate position where, you know, especially me being part of a, a small party, um, I do have that platform and I can raise these issues. Um, and again, it was, you know, it, it, it was that, um, do I want other people in here thinking that everything they've told me about anything that's ever happened to them just doesn't matter? Um, or am I going to use this as an opportunity to make sure that we affect some change in this place? And the reality is as a workplace, Parliament House does not have the systems, the procedures, the protocols in place uh, to deal appropriately with sexual harassment. Um, so this was one of a series of things that, you know, I wanted to see um, done and, and I've worked with the attorney um, to implement some of these measures to date. Um, we've just changed the Equal Opportunity Act in South Australia um, to ensure that if a complaint is made to the commissioner between two members of parliament, that is no longer exempt from the EO Act because it was. Um, and I um, moved amendments that would extend that to the judiciary and to local councils as well, because there is no reason for those sorts of things to be taking place in the workplace. So I'm really glad those things got up. I'm really yeah. glad my motion into the legal profession got up. What I'm not really pleased about is that our treasurer thought that $152,000 was not worthy of being spent on an inquiry um, into Parliament House, which the former... EO Commissioner has indicated um, together with um, Kate Jenkins that they could do um, to identify the prevalence of the problem here and how you should be addressing it and what you need to do. Because right now, we don't have that. But yeah. what we thought we had, I know, as a matter of fact, doesn't work. Um, and if I can just say one more thing about the Equal Opportunity Act, because I think this is really, I'm, I'm, this really struck me. Um, and Connie, got, I might just jump in and just say, just for those in the audience that aren't familiar with the Equal Opportunity Act, that that act is the state act, which basically says it is unlawful, illegal to sexually harass or discriminate against another person, whether in a school, workplace, wherever you are, um, on the basis of race, sex, um, sexuality, um, you know, all of, all of it, um, but that's our local act, the Equal Opportunity Act. Sorry, Connie, go on. Yeah, no, and, and I'm glad you did that because that is the only act that we have that makes this behaviour unlawful. Um, so in, the, in this instance, we're talking about the workplace. There is no other recourse. Um, the only other recourse is criminal, if there, you know, if there are grounds, um, and it's not the same outcome, but is uh, criminal action, um, a prosecution by the police. Um, so, so if you want to do something about that behaviour towards you, that's your that's your recourse. Now, this is really interesting, though, and, and I just want to make this point. Even after we made those amendments, uh, and these are ongoing discussions that I'm having with the attorney, I said to her, attorney, it's still not good enough because even under the current rules, as we've changed them, I could walk into Parliament next week while Parliament is sitting. Um, I could walk past another member in Parliament. I could grope them. I could racially vilify them. I could sexually harass them. And provided that Parliament is sitting, even if we are not involved in the debate, even if, if this happens, you know, behind the corner of the chamber, 
that will still be covered by parliamentary privilege. Yeah. Yeah. That um, is, yeah. I um, mean, it's absolutely um, an issue. And yeah, I mean, and uh, exemption of politicians, but exemptions for powerful people in our society, I think really has to be looked at. I'm sure, um, I mean, Kay, I um, imagine this is something that you have looked at through the Respect at Work report. Um, so I might just bring you in at this point. So welcome. How are you? Thank you. I'm very, very well and very privileged to hear this conversation. Great. So um, everyone, um, thanks so much, Connie, by the way. That was um, excellent. Jump in whenever you want to. Um, Kate Jenkins is the is Australia's Sex Discrimination Commissioner and a member of the Australian Human Rights Commission. Her purpose is to advance gender equality consistent with the Sex Discrimination Act and Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. So it's a pretty big job. Um, Kate is leading a number of projects, including the recently launched Respect at Work National Inquiry into Sexual Harassment in Australian Workplaces report. Um, and Kate will talk a little bit about that tonight. Um, and she's got some collaborative projects on cultural reform with the Australian Defence Force. She's also the co-chair of Play by the Rules, a joint project between human rights agencies and sports commissions to make grassroots sports safe, fair and inclusive. So welcome, Kate. Thank you. Um, so, um, Kate, I just wanted to ask you, firstly, in relation to Connie's response about leadership and, um, and position and privilege and whether that gives you kind of a duty to call out sexist behaviour, I'm wondering what you think about that. Look, it was a, a great conversation because through the National Inquiry, I heard experiences of sexual harassment by working people at all levels. So, you know, it was as high as senior politicians and people in on boards, but it was also everyday workers who absolutely couldn't survive without their casual job, migrant workers. Um, and it was interesting listening. It's so important we hear these stories, but actually Connie described and she you know how difficult it's difficult it affects your entire personal life you're suddenly in a story that was not of your making mm -hmm. um, and what uh, what in terms of the National Inquiry there's a couple of things that Connie said and you know it is a phenomenal thing to be able to say I stood up and then I changed the law because the South Australian Equal Opportunity Act has coverage that does not exist now in any other state so that that is really recognising kind of the position. But actually, even through the inquiry, we travelled the country, including coming to Adelaide, and, and some people listening, I'm sure, participated in the consultations. When people came and told their story, they pretty regularly said, um, firstly, that it, for some people, it's the first time they had been believed. So even telling your story is really difficult when you're questioned and, you know, really undermined. But the second is a bit like Connie's reason. The main reason um, women that we spoke to wanted to speak was because they could perhaps make it better for the future, for other people. And that, um, that was a very big driver. The reasons they didn't want to speak is because of the personal cost the loss of income, you know, careers are affected long term. These are real, really concerning. But to think that, um, uh, so it takes a huge amount of courage. And we heard, and and I think you know, Abby certainly um, the working women centres. Uh, just a shout out in the report. We basically found that not only did they assist us a lot with the inquiry. Um, but when we looked at information and supports, the working women's centres were almost the best model of a holistic support for victims. Uh, if you go within your workplace often, and I'm interested to hear from Beck and Erin and their experiences, but if you go to your kind of your employer, bring your complaint forward, you find yourself in some jug and order of an investigation, which, you know, can be really difficult. And sometimes people said, I just wanted information about what my rights were and I just needed support to kind of cope. And the working women's centres we found, and so we did write in the report that, you know, very supportive, were much better at just kind of respecting the whole person rather than driving people into some kind of legal system that's really important that it's there but can be really disempowering rather than empowering. And just so, just for the cheap seats at the back, um, 
the Sex Discrimination Commission is just saying that the Working Women's Centre does it best. We have the best model. <laughs> we deserve a lot more funding. This is, yeah, just for everyone, just we're all clear <laughs> about that. That's recommendation 47 in the report. So thank you very much, um, Kay. That's great. <laughs> um, so there's, so uh, recommendation 47 is um, to never, ever get rid of Working Women's Centres. We do our best and you should copy our model uh, across Australia and across the world. Um, but there are 55 recommendations in that report and you traveled all over Australia and you heard stories like Connie's just told us and uh, you know that Erin and Beck are going to um, talk to us about but I'm wondering whether uh, there was anything in that journey or through your findings that you thought well that you found surprising Yes, when we released the report, the most uh, common uh, a common question to me was what was surprising. So what was surprising to other people, I think, although perhaps not the people tuning in today, um, was how common sexual harassment still is. Uh, the survey told us that one in three Australian workers had experienced sexual harassment in the last five years. And as we've already started to talk about, we found it was in every industry at er every level and in every location. And particularly the highest rate of sexual harassment was for young workers uh, so particularly the 18 to 29 year old age bracket but it was actually really shocking I think that 15 to 17 year old still 20 percent or you know one in five had experienced sexual harassment that's just a really bad indictment on our workplaces um, mm. so it's something that's very much experienced by young people who are the least powerful who can't speak up who certainly uh, can't change the laws, but um, but it's good because I think it's good to know this because we're starting to understand the prevalence without having to put people on the spot. For me, I guess the most shocking thing is, even though I knew it in theory, in practice, hearing those stories and realising the long-term impacts of an experience of sexual harassment, uh, both personally affecting people and families, communities, but also the long impact on their careers. People saying, well, I didn't go back to that workplace because I didn't feel safe and I left that industry. So we're talking about law. There were a lot of lawyers who came to that and said, I just didn't feel I could be safe in that environment. So they never had the career that they could have had. And in many cases, they never earned the money that they could have earned. But my, uh, my kind of sense about, so that was an 18 month process, as you said, 55 recommendations, a lot about prevention and some, you know, on data and some on supports, uh, but particularly a focus on the workplace, shifting their focus to prevention. But I, I would say the optimistic thing, which is what this conversation is as well, is that the kind of me too moment, you know, if you think the Weinstein thing started it, is in Australia, there's been this escalating building kind of pressure and building ability for people to speak up. So I don't think our system should rely on the courage of victims to, uh, to, to work. Uh, but at the same time, I think it's really important that people are starting to feel the ability to talk. And I think Connie's example um, it is a very big, you know, important example for lots of people who this is happening to, to feel like it's not just me and I can speak and I will be heard. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm just wondering, I mean, um, are you, the other panellists, are you surprised by those figures? You know, one in five work, one in five women are sexually harassed in the workplace in Australia. Does that surprise you or was that, um, or did you think, oh yeah, that's a, that's about right, given your own experiences? Erin, what do you think? Doesn't surprise me one little bit. No. <laughs> no. Um, well, I mean, we'll absolutely come and um, ask you a few questions about that in a moment. But um, yeah, Beck, what did what did you think about that? Were you surprised as a student in a, on working and living on a um, working and studying on a university campus? Not surprised at all. Um, it, I really wish I was, but unfortunately, no, I don't think that's the case. Like, it's just it's shocking. And it's distressing and it's upsetting and more should be done. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think it's likely that most women um, wouldn't find that surprising and then um, and, and possibly um, quite a few men would. Um, but uh, look, hopefully webinars like this are going to um, help us move that statistic. Um, I wanted to, uh, you mentioned, Kate, about the Harvey Weinstein case. Um, and really that brought up a 
lot of um hmm. Oh, sorry. Did I? I just went for a minute. I did a Connie. Sorry. <laughs> um, sorry, everyone. All right. So I was talking about the Harvey Weinstein um, uh, case. And in, in that Harvey Weinstein case, there were a lot of non-disclosure agreements that were signed over the course of 20, 30 years by women who had made allegations against Harvey Weinstein or who women really who were sexually harassed or, or assaulted by Harvey Weinstein. Um, and so I'm wondering, Kate, what can you kind of explain to the audience what a non-disclosure agreement is? Um, and then further to that, let us know whether you think that they are helpful or they assist the situation or, or whether there's kind of room for reform around NDAs. Yes, I feel like, Abby, you just went on to working. I know, I've been on enough webinars to know you went into the I think we might have fallen off air, panic yeah. <laughs> moment then, but we seem to still be on, well, you and I are anyway. Um, so non-disclosure agreements or NDAs are agreements that are entered between, often in the sexual harassment case, uh, an individual complainant and the employer. And it's uh, the part of the agreement that's relevant, often for payment of money, the person who's been harassed or alleges harassment is uh, agrees to not speak to anyone about the, the events that have occurred. In, in practice in Australia, what we found is there is sort of a particular link um, and possibly an unintended consequence of how our legal system works, how the media reporting works. Uh, so when the Weinstein thing came out, um, obviously his behaviour was pretty devastating, but then to realise that the organisation had kind of almost empowered him to continue his predation was pretty shocking. Um, so how it works in Australia is, and I, I know Connie made that comment about the media, is that over time our laws really ho only hold organisations to account if there's a complaint um, because there's no a proactive obligation on employers. Um, and over the course, and I, I'm probably longer than lots of people on this, but over the course of the last 20 or 30 years, employers have over time learned that if you can avoid a complaint, then you can avoid legal liability. You do that by reaching a settlement. And the thing that you want to do is protect your reputation because the media reporting can be very expensive. So there has become this practice of uh, both within a workplace requiring people keeping the details of a complaint confidential and then if there's actually an agreement to enter into that agreement some confidentiality clauses. Our inquiry found that whilst there are definitely reasons why uh, victims and, and people involved with complaints might like confidentiality, having a blanket obligation imposed by the employer where the individual really can no, no longer speak at all about their own experience, having that, that sort of agreement uh, was harmful basically unhelpful, it drove things underground, it probably con contributed to the ongoing sexual harassment, it let people be repeat offenders. Um, but also, if someone's been harassed, to never be able to speak about it again is actually compounding the power imbalance. So we made some recommendations that new guidelines should be prepared that make sure that that uh, unintended consequence doesn't happen. And I think, Abby, you know, we also made a recommendation about um, if government would support a disclosure process, because on the other side, what we did here was people found telling their stories really empowering. And whilst you might not get the justice of going to court and winning the case, to have an avenue, including through our inquiry, to tell your story to be believed, to feel like it was going to contribute to broader change, uh, people said that was incredibly helpful. Yeah. Um, I think we we find at the centre that the women coming forward, um, uh, who, the women who are assisting to make complaints about sexual harassment, kind of, it's a bit of half and half. Every woman that comes to us says, I want to make the workplace a better place for my colleagues and for women that come after me. They're always uh, collectively thinking about that. Um, 
And there are some who want to tell their stories and others who don't. I guess we need a system that's really working for both and ensuring that there's not that um, abuse, so where we're silencing and gagging an issue. Um, because, you know, I also think that what there's, if, it's, if everyone on this webinar is not overly surprised by the one in five women who have been sexually harassed in the workplace, um, um, but uh, big portions of the community are, then it means there is some gagging of the story. Um, and that's certainly something we're very interested in at the center. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for that, Kate. That was excellent. Um, Abby, Abby, can yeah. I just tell one thing? The actual stat, because I gave you a couple of stats, but the oh. big stat is one in three. So oh. it's two It's two in five women and one in four men, uh, which I know too much about these stats, but yep. one in three. So it's even higher. It used to be one in five. Uh, thanks, Kate. Thanks for correcting that. Yeah, one in three. That's really important. Um, so... Next, we're going to move to Erin Hennessy. Erin um, is a Erin is a female plumber, um, so you don't come across uh, female plumbers very often. So it's really exciting to hear from Erin, um, who has been working in male-dominated industries for a long time. She grew up in a small Victorian town um, with a farming family, and she became a dairy farmer. After an, after an itch, she moved to WA and had a stint in the mines. She then ended up in South Australia and met her wife while working in the racing industry. And her wife really pushed her to reach for her dreams and become a tradie. Erin um, was able to land a mature age uh, plumbing apprenticeship uh, and she's worked on uh, um, jobs like the Samri um, and the Ra. And um, in 2015, she put her hand up to become a union organizer and she was successfully un um, elected in that um, election. So she's the first female state official, that is union official in the plumbing sector, which is so exciting and such an awesome achievement. So congratulations, Erin. Thanks. <laughs> yep, <laughs> modest, good, yep. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, um, I said before, Erin, it's really not often that you come across a female plumber. I don't know how many of uh, you there are in Australia, but I'm sure there's not many. Um, so tell us, how did you end up as a plumber? Uh, do you want the short story or the long story? Like <laughs> media? Yeah. Yeah, yeah look, um, so... Uh, I think you've given a pretty good description of where I started. So, uh, you know, grew up in a small country town, you know, wanted to get an apprenticeship when I was growing up, really just couldn't land one. Um, quite frankly, it was because of the fact that I was a girl um, and that was the feedback that I kept receiving. Um, sort of gave up on that dream, ended up uh, being a dairy farmer like my dad, um, got the itch, ended up in WA working in the mines, came to South Australia um, and like you said, uh, Mel pushed me, <clears throat> she pushed me to um, reach my dreams basically. And so, you know, um, I put my hand out and said, look, I think I want to have a crack at um, becoming a plumbing apprentice um, or a plumber in general. And uh, yeah, had a crack and uh, got, got in the door, um, luckily. Um, and here I am today. Um, it, it wasn't, it wasn't easy just to be clear on that. Um, and it wasn't easy to, you know, continue through that role really. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, I guess we'll get to the sort of hard and difficult bits. Um, the other day when we met for coffee, Erin, you told me a story about, um, when you first wanted to get into a trade and didn't the, the bloke say to you that, like, well, as you said, he just said no because you're a girl. But wasn't your competitor maybe not the sharpest tool in the shed? What's the what's the story there? Yeah, look, we're going back 15 years. Um, but basically, from what I recall, the feedback was, you know, along the lines of, you know, he's a bit of a dumb shit, but yeah. <laughs> I'm going to take him over you even though you're better because you're a girl, you know. Um, and that was heartbreaking, quite frankly. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, such so a such a huge barrier. You're the better candidate, but and for it to be so full and frank and in your face like that. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so you, um, so um, Kate Jenkins' report um, into sexual harassment. It talks about how prevalent sexual harassment is in male-dominated industries. I mean, uh, you were a commercial plumber, and now you're an elected union organizer, but two male-dominated industries. But I'm just wondering, in construction, do you think? sexual harassment is a problem on site? Yeah, <laughs> there's, there's, there's really no dispute about it. Um, 
you know, and I think a lot of the scenarios come from um, not calling it out. Um, and it's hard to do that. You know, um, I did tell you a story and I'm happy to um, tell it here um, about, you know, when I was an apprentice, um, I was up on the top deck, you know, marking out some holes that needed to be cored. And, you know, I felt someone that was up there doing stuff behind me, but I couldn't see it. And I asked my, you know, male colleague, um, who was also an apprentice at the time, um, whether, you know, you know, I felt uncomfortable. Can you just, you know, let me know what's going on? Cause I don't, you know, something's going on. And he did. And he told me, and he said, you know, he was making some pretty crude, um, uh, I don't even know how to doggy style <laughs> movements <laughs> um, behind me um, and not that far behind me either um, and um, said it wasn't appropriate. And so I went to my supervisor and called it out. The, the sad part of that story isn't that, well, it is that it happened, but also how it was dealt with. So, you know, they pulled everyone into a big room and literally put the perpetrator in the room with the person who, what they would call a dobber, you know? So, you know, they sort of made the comment that, you know, oh, well, nothing's going to happen on site, but as soon as he walks out that gate, you know? Um, so they actually physically, the employer that I worked for physically removed that apprentice secretly from the site. Now they tried to do the same with me and I just called it out. I said, no, I'm not, I'm not leaving. If they get away with this, they're just going to continue to do it. So I'm not leaving. Um, and they were really taken aback that I, I wouldn't leave site, but there was no way I was leaving that site and letting him get away with it so you know but really it was just letting the perpetrator continue to do it and that's the sad part about it um and just the way it was dealt with is ridiculous so yeah it's you know um it it's there and it's in your face um and you know it i think what what we see is that you know we tend to let it slip a lot more in, a, in the male dominated industries. You know, if someone walked up to you and slapped you on the bum and said, Hey, how you going? You know, you'd just be like, Oh yeah, whatever. It's, it's Frank, you know, he just does it. You know, if, mm -hmm. if someone in the white collar area did that, you, you would be called out straight away. And, you know, we just, ah, ha, ha, you laugh it off, but you know, that's the stuff that we need to call them out on. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not one of the, uh, how do I say this better? Uh, I'm, I'm pretty happy to call people out. You know, I'll, I'll tell it how it is um, right from the get go, but there is people out there that won't, they won't feel comfortable doing that. And I think that until, you know, our male counterparts stand up with us, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's really going to be feeling like you're trying to move a mountain with a, with a dessert spoon, quite frankly. Um, so yeah. Yeah. And, and Erin, have you always been like that? Have you always been ready to call it out and pretty confident and, you know, kind of a, a warrior for your sisters? Like what's, what's your journey around that? Um, uh, uh, there's two parts to that question. Um, I've always been a bit of a warrior as in I'll call things out. Um, I'll stand up for my, my friends and my family and all that. But at the same time, you know, 10, 15 years ago, you probably would have called me a redneck, quite frankly, because, you know, it was just the people that I was surrounded with and the knowledge that I was gaining back then um, was different. And, you know, everyone, you know, everyone changes. And I think that a lot of that comes from, a lot of that change comes from the people that you surround yourself with. So, you know, I'm, I'm currently working in the union movement and the people around me, you know, I'll, I'll say something that I would have said, you know, before and they'll call me out on it. And I'll say, well, no, you can't say that, you know, I'll, I'll laugh at it and think it's funny, but then they won't. So, you know, you change, um, you know, depending on the people that you surround yourself with, I think you can say that. And I'm happy to say that, you know, I've, I've come a long way in the last 15 years. So. Yeah. Um, and do you think, um, that progression has, does that have a lot to do with joining the union movement? And do, and do you think the union movement has a place, um, to in, in fighting sexual harassment in the workplace? Yeah. So, um, I think that, um, you know, if you're not, if anyone online right now isn't in their union, you should definitely be joining right now. I've got to give that a plug. Um, but really, you know, we, we, we're in a male dominated industry and I'm, I'm hoping that some of my sisters are on here from the ETU CPU and uh, listening in because, you know, 
I wanted to, you know, uh, give them a bit of a plug as well because, you know, there's, they've got, you know, Facebook book groups. The girls are really active. You know, they, you know, some of the stuff on there, like even I'm shocked by because, you know, it's never really talked about, you know, stuff like that. And, you know, some, my, you know, when I, when I first spoke to you guys, I sort of said, oh, no, I haven't really had any sexual harassment situations happen to me until I sort of thought about it. Um, and that really is a big one. And to think that I've sort of pushed it aside and thought, oh, yeah, it's not really that bad. Well, it's pretty bad, you know, when you think about it. But yeah. you just do it and you move on. Um, and, you know, the, these girls, you know, they've got a Facebook group and everyone's involved and, you know, they'll put questions out to each other and everyone will comment on it. If you have any private questions you want to ask, you can. You know, they're really active in helping each other out. And it's amazing, like, you know, when I first started and you go back to the comment that you made before, um, you know, there, there wouldn't be too many plumbers out there. When I first started, there was one other plumber that I was aware of and I never saw her, you know, at, at trade school, never, ever saw her. She was always just a ghost. Um, now, you know, I've, you know, I've got about, I want to say three or four members that have joined. Um, and you know, that's just members. That doesn't mean that's all of the female plumbers in South Australia. So, um, you know, it's, it's, um, great to see that but it's also great to see that they have a, a safe place to go and speak to others that are in the trades or in the in the working in the industries that they work in because it is really good to be able to you know throw questions back at other people and say hey this happened to me has anything like this ever happened to you and it gives them that power to know that yeah. they're not alone yeah and i mean just on the um we, we service um, non-unionized workers at the center, um, but we are tiny. Like you know, we have the we do not have the resources to advise and represent and inform everyone. But if you do go and join your union and pay your dues, that's that's your entitlement. That's what you get from um, the union movement. That's get get that's what you get from your union and you're really, you know, your union is only ever as strong as the membership. So um, I absolutely um, uh, like you, Erin, encourage people to join their union. Um, so um, I guess, I mean, you've talked a lot about sexual harassment tonight in your um, profession and, but also your own kind of um, journey and perspective and political progression uh, and feminist progression. I'm wondering, you know, on a, on a daily basis. And I imagine, you know, you're going out to site, you're a union, union organizer, you're talking to a bunch of blokes. Um, I'm guessing it comes up a bit for you as you've described tonight. How do you deal with it? Um, I think sometimes you have to be, uh, how do I say, uh, politically correct. Other times, you know, it depends on the circumstances. It really depends on where you're at, what workplace you're at, who you're with, all of those sort of circumstances um, change the conversation. But I think um, I'm pretty good at calling shit out, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. um, and I've said that time and time again in this conference already. Um, so, you know, if someone said something inappropriate to me, you know, I, I'll straight out be like, not, not appropriate, mate. N not okay. You can't, you can't talk shit like that. Um, but at the same time, you know, and I think we're all, we're all guilty of it. Um, laughing at jokes that aren't appropriate or aren't funny, but we just tend to do it. Even sometimes it's, 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 a, oh yeah, that's funny. Yeah. Uncomfortable laugh. It's, it's really um, giving them justification of what they're doing, you know, so they're just going to continue to do it. So, you know, and one of the things that I would um, refer back to the ETU CP group is that, you know, they've sort of put platforms out there to say, you know, what would you do if they say inappropriate things? And one of the things that they say, one of the girls has said um, that she would just stand there and ignore you. She would just, you know, the joke will come through and they'll be, rather than, <laughs> yeah, whatever, um, they will literally just stop it right in its tracks. And, you know, the reactions that they've said that they've gotten are hilarious, um, but also they don't do it. They don't tend to do it again. Um, that coupled with the fact that, you know, if you have male colleagues um, or male um, workmates, you know, I'll refer to them, male workmates with you that, that you know that they know it's inappropriate, um, have a chat to them because a lot of the time 
they will be willing to call it out. And Mm. as much as it hurts me to say this shit, that sometimes it takes a man to pull a man up and they won't change until that happens. And sometimes they won't change at all. But, you know, and, and it hurts me to think that I need a man to stand up for me. But, you know, it really has quite the impact, um, especially in those especially in those male dominated um, industries. Um, it, it does have an impact. So, you know, if you, f- if you don't feel comfortable calling it out yourself, um, certainly have a chat to one of your colleagues, but also get in touch with your union because that, you know, when one of the girls calls me and says, oh, you know, I'm out on my own and, you know, I'm, they join up, but they're out on their own. I, I tell them we've got a group, you know, get in touch. We go do events. We talk about, we sit down and we have a couple of beers and we talk about, you know, the shits and giggles that happen, you know, the stuff that, um, you know, that I deal with and my stories, they have similar stories and how do you deal with it? You know, so Mm -hmm. it's really good to have that conversation. Yeah. Um, Connie, what do you think about the sort of male champions of, uh, male champions of change? I think that's an organization um, and uh, a kind of movement in Australia at the moment, but this idea that we do need men to come to the table and start calling out inappropriate behavior and to, to have a culture change around sexual harassment. What do you think? Can I just say, I'm really blown away by what Erin's just said, um, because there are so many similarities and so many differences um, at the same time with, with our, you know, our, our respective workplaces. Uh, the, the, the legal profession is female dominated, yet most of the offending occurs in that profession against females. Um, so, you know, we, we have um, victimising in the same sorts of ways that Erin has pointed out. But also worse than that, it is... You know, I think we make a conscious choice at some point. We say, we have a goal and we just want to get there. And we're going to just put up with whatever crap is thrown our way until we get to that goal. And most successful female politicians have gotten there because they've done precisely that. And it's not until after they've left politics that they've spoken out and said, actually, this is what it was really like. I've been surprised that the number of male, there's the, there's the blokes in parliament that, know it happens, um, that don't do anything about it. Um, and then there's the ones who, who, who it, it's, like you, it's like you've made this huge revelation that this could possibly have happened in here. And it strikes me that there are, you know, men in here um, who have no idea about the extent um, of sexual harassment and I say to them, you know, this could be happening to your daughter. It could be happening, you know, to, to your girls. Um, why on earth would you encourage them to go into a, into a profession where this is so prevalent and not speak out about it and not want to do something about it? And, you know, mm-hmm. you, you see this, the pattern of behaviour is really odd. Like, it's, I mean, there have been men in here who have shown amazing support to me. Um but by the same token, there are colleagues in here who, without knowing, without without knowing any of the facts, um, have chosen to ignore me for for doing what I did, and, and I find that astounding. I just find that astounding because you have no idea, um, you know what what has occurred, um, but you've chosen to effectively victimise a victim. Mm. Um, or blame them, you know, for, you know, the level of publicity or the political furor that this has caused or whatever, and not actually stop to think, crap, do we have a problem here that we actually need to be addressing? Um, So in in politics, it's sometimes lost. Yeah, um, and it's sort of incredible, really, to ignore is, to ignore and look away and put the blinkers up, as I think, Erin, you just um, intimated, it's it's dehumanising. It's yeah. like you, you don't exist. But, um, and I also think like Connie just done it. Just, I'll just be a panelist for a second. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but um, that the, you know, that idea of 
um, what about if you, what about if this was your mother, if this was your daughter, if this was your niece, if this was some woman that was connected to you, I think is it can be really powerful and important. And I, I personally go always go a step further. What if that person was a human being? Like we don't have to, we do, they don't have value. Women don't just have value because they, of their connection to a man, you know, like we are, we are women, we, we are mothers, we're daughters, we're nieces, we're all of it, but we're also human and we um, deserve dignity and respect. And I think, um, you know, I have only personally had the um, courage to say that to men on a couple of occasions um, and, uh, once it went very badly and then the other time it was, it was quite good. Um, so I think that like, you know, like when they walk past you in the corridor and they ignore you, it's dehumanizing when they, you know, because they're not thinking about us as people, they're thinking about us as lesser. Um, anyway, that just really annoys me. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I'll point out, you know, I wrote that down before Connie, you said, um, that when you were talking, you said that, um, you you know, there's a certain, um, willingness to accept a level of arrogance, but you have to draw a line somewhere. And I think everyone has their own personal line, but I mean, I think that there's a point where every woman should have the ability to say, no, I'm not appropriate, you know, simple as that, you know, just draw the line there. And Erin, I think when I was talking to Abby, I said this, you know, it's, it's funny especially in the in in you know the two professions that i've chosen how much do you really want to get to your goal because i can tell you categorically there's behavior in here that if it happened to me at a restaurant at a bar at a you know out in public somewhere um over years you would have you know what you would have said to a bloke who who does certain things to you if you were outside this place and yet while i was working towards my goal i just accepted it you know you're a, you know you, you just you you just accept it because you don't want to be the person who's who's going to listen to you anyway um th that's the problem that we have and now i know more than ever that the the young women in here who have spoken to me um have all been fearful of the same thing who's going to believe me what's that going to do to my job how am i going to get another job in adelaide there goes my you know I, i've got political aspirations they go out the window. That's the thought process that that they're having um, in terms of whether they should call out behaviour. And so they're just not calling it out. Mm -hmm. That's uh, not acceptable. Yeah, um, absolutely. I think, um, you know, we have, we have touched on all different types of workplaces tonight. We've talked about Parliament House, you know, the... What, the, the top workplace we've talked about um the australia's you know a national inquiry into sexual harassment in the in the workplace the union movement the construction site and i think now's a really good time to bring it um to rebecca who um is the women's officer um at adelaide university and um you know there's a bit of stuff going on at adelaide uni in terms of um, sexual harassment in the workplace and just generally um, sexual assault on um, and um, the devaluing of women on that on that campus. So welcome back. How are you going? Good. How are you? Yeah, really good. Um, so uh, just Rebecca is in her final year of, bat of her Bachelor of Psycho Psychological Science at the University of Adelaide. She is the elected student uh, SRC Women's Officer for 2020. Um, and she's also been advocating for the U of A Women's Collective on campus. Um, and she's been closely monitoring the ICAC investigation into former Vice Chancellor Peter Rathjen. Um, for, I mean, most locals will know this, um, but for the audience, Peter Rathjen was the, previously the Vice Chancellor of Adelaide University. Um, and he was found to have committed sexual assault and harassment towards other female staff members um, and that was the subject of an ICAC investigation in South Australia and in fact the ICAC commissioner released a pretty damning statement about um, Peter Rathjen and his um, and and you know the, the way in which the university and the institution dealt with that with those complaints and that behavior. Um, Rebecca is also um, an incredible activist. She's there was the guest speaker and also co-organizer of the SNAP rally, Solidarity with Survivors in response to the Peter Rathjen um, scandal. And she has been demanding that the university be accountable and work harder to create a safer campus culture. 
Um, so, Beck, thank you so much and thank you for all the work you're doing, in particular, um, you know, organising rallies really in the spirit of Reclaim the Night for women to be out in the public and taking up space. Um, I wanted to first ask you, as, you know, as a student at Adelaide University, but also as the SRC Women's Officer, what did you think when you heard about Peter Rathjen's comment, uh, uh, sorry, conduct, um, and how did you respond? Uh, well, I guess from a student experience, uh, we were angry, we were upset, we were frustrated that the university covered it up and tried to keep it a secret for as long as possible. Uh, we were disgusted. We, we felt like our university lost some of its integrity that it so consistently tries to portray to society. Um, and it's just been, it's been quite a distressing time for a lot of students as well. Obviously with like the um, End Rape on Campus uh, Australia campaigns and with the National Sexual Assault Survey, that was due to be held in 2020, but unfortunately due to COVID, it's moved a little bit um, forward, back. Um, it's just, it's so upsetting to actually have to be dealing with this. Um, students deserve better. Uh, everyone deserves to feel safe in their workplace. Everyone deserves to feel safe on campus. Everyone deserves to feel safe everywhere. So the fact that this happened at a place where we're supposed, it's supposed to be a safe space for everyone, it's appalling. Um, so with my work with the Women's Collective, uh, we decided to run a Solidarity with Survivors Snap Rally in support of the female staff workers that Ratchin did sexually assault and use the opportunity to band together as staff and students to demand the university administration to do better by following a list of demands. Um, so I won't read them all out now, but essentially one of the main demands that we did kind of push forward to the university administration was that we would like uh, Peter Rafton's uh, signature on testimonies to be removed um, from past and present students who have been re received it, um, just for many reasons alone. Uh, as more and more details began to emerge about how he was not only a perpetrator on our campus, but also the University of Melbourne, and possibly the University of Tasmania, Again, we began to question the integrity of our university. Where was the background checks? Why was he let off due to ill health? I mean, why was he given a 300K payout? Um, why were students and staff repeatedly lied to and kept in the dark about such a distressing time that was happening? Um, I think this is a bigger conversation, not just about the serious misconduct, but also about a toxic campus culture where sexism, misogyny, exist and they protect perpetrators and they allow perpetrators to repeat and offend again and again and again. So that's kind of a little bit about what we've been working on there. Just uh, muted from the, the feedback, but um, Beck, I'm just wondering um, when you first stepped on campus, I think you're in your final year now, aren't you? Yeah. yeah. So when you first stepped on campus, um, were you expecting to be studying and um, hanging out and, and, and being on a campus where there is a culture of uh, sexual harassment and, and misogyny and organisations like End Rape on Campus must exist. Was that surprising to you? It actually was. Um, I, I usually have a lot of pride in the University of Adelaide. I've told a lot of people that I really do enjoy our university, but the more you actually experience the campus culture, the more you actually learn that, no, like, this is not okay. There is, why should we have and rape on campus Australia advocating for us? Why is this a thing? Like, it was, it was a lot to kind of take in once it kind of sunk in. But, yeah, this is the experience for a lot of university students and university staff members too. So, yeah. Um, and you went ahead and um, I know one of the demands of the uh, university was to remove Peter Rathjen's name from the testimony, um, from, you know, the certificate that you get at the graduation. Um, what, um, why was that important to remove his name from your certificate? And, and not just yours, but, you know, congratulations for any, any woman or any person that wanted that, um, uh, that signature removed. I guess um, students found it really important that this was made possible was because it was a step towards acknowledging that the university will actually take a strong stand against perpetrators and stand with survivors of sexual harassment and assault. 
it's not business as usual. We shouldn't sweep this under the rug. Um, we need to acknowledge that it happened and we need to acknowledge that we need to do better for staff and students on campus to be able to feel safe and to not feel like they are at risk of being sexually assaulted or harassed. Um, it's a step towards a safer campus culture. So we found it really, really important to push for this. And as you can see in some of the comments, a lot of students were really happy and grateful for this. So um, it was something small, but significant. It still meant something. So that's why we really pushed for that and it was made possible. So. Yeah. Um, and I just might read out one of, um, one of our audience members, Lazarus um, says, um, just got my testimony replaced today. Thank you for advocating for me, Beck. Um, and also our very own Maddie um, Saar, who is an employee of the Working Women's Centre. Um, she's a recent graduate um, and she also um, had that signature removed. So I think, um, you know, thanks so much for all of your efforts. Um, I'm, maybe Beck, like, obviously the work that you're doing is incredible. Snap rallies, you know, demanding that um, his signature is removed from certificates. How does, um, if you're, if anyone in the audience um, is a student at Adelaide University, how do they get involved in the Women's Collective and how are they, how do they come together and work with you to um, make the campus and the university a better place? Yeah, um, the U of A Women's Collective, oh, sorry, um, aims to advocate for women on campus and beyond. Um, we run a lot of uh, charity events. We run a lot of social events for women. Um, we also have a women's room on campus as well, but we are, um, it's a nice dedicated space that we look after and hold a lot of weekly events as well. Um, you can just get involved by being on our Facebook page, even just dropping us a message, um, showing support by sharing articles. Um, there's been a lot of controversy about our right to exist on campus. Um, so that has been quite a lot of the forefront of the fighting as well this year. Um, but yeah, definitely get involved. A wider community forefront would be amazing. Um, and yeah. Yeah, okay, that's great. Um, all right, well, thanks so much, Beck. I think um, we are kind of running a little late and so I'm gonna just do a few group questions. Um, uh, my first question is about the redistribution of shame from victims to perpetrators in our society. Um, often, um, and we've heard a lot about it tonight, you know, Connie, you were talking about that humiliation. I mean, obviously through your strength and leadership, you've also felt humiliation and, embar and embarrassment through this process. And that's a, that's a feature of shame. Um, I'm wondering, you know, how do we as a society move from the victim feeling shame to actually the perpetrator feeling shame? Um, Beck, what do you think about that? Uh, I think we really need to surround the survivor with support and drown out that casual sexism. As Erin mentioned with the awkward jokes, like they're not just awkward jokes, like they're not just jokes to people. They can actually really leave quite traumatic experiences and feelings to on a person. So obviously drowning out that sexism prejudice in society and allowing them to have a platform and be safe is a very, very important thing. So that's what I think. Yeah, great. Kate? Um, well, first and foremost, I guess my focus, I listen to this and I absolutely embrace every, uh, every other speaker has been amazing, but it should not be on the shoulders of victims or women just broadly to change a culture where actually it's the power disparity that's the problem. So, you know, that expectation that women should have to speak out and it's their responsibility. So I guess my first, my first comment would be a lot of the focus of how I think we need to shift is towards prevention, is towards saying actually these cultures should not exist so that people like Erin don't have to get up the courage to speak up. Um, and I think part of that is engaging men in this conversation because they experience sexual harassment, they perpetrate it, and they're the managers and the bosses. Uh, but in terms of shame, I think, Abby, I've told you that they're in the US, the woman who actually first came up with the definition of sexual harassment is a woman called Catherine McKinnon in 1979. And I've heard her speaking more recently, and she's saying, we are at a moment for the first time in the whole history of sexual harassment, particularly following the Me Too movement, 
where there is now an expectation it's shifted from saying this is the fault of women to actually this is the fault of the harasser, the men. And she said, actually, all the laws that we had haven't done as much as the voices, the swelling voices that have come behind. And so that's that's encouraging. Um, so I think the, sh the shift is happening, but I still think my main focus is it shouldn't happen at all and changing those cultures that permit, that, you know, allow these things to happen should, needs to change and it's time. Yeah, absolutely. What do you think, Connie? Uh, look, I agree with all the comments, um, but I think um, Kate hit the nail on the head um, and we shouldn't have to rely on individuals to come out and, you know, call out bad behaviour. We do need to address this. We need cultural shifts. But I just want to give you one example um, and I'm going to talk about the legal profession in my response. Um, I think there's also benefit at looking at changing the focus um, and as part of that motion that we've done into the legal profession, this is just one profession, um, I've asked them to look at New South Wales as a jurisdiction that has shifted the focus from um, discrimination or harassment to a workplace incident. And if you think about sexual harassment in the same context as any other workplace hazard, that can be quite profound. If that presented the same risk as a slip and fall or a, you know, a, a wire hanging, um, employers would be doing everything to ensure that their employees weren't exposed to those risks. But we, we haven't really thought about sexual harassment through that lens. Um, and they are doing that in New South Wales. I think it's, I think it's, I mean, it's blown me away just reading what they're doing there. Um, and I think that's something we really need to start considering. Um, how do we actually look at sexual harassment and what, through what men should we be focusing to ensure that employers um, are actually treating it with the, with the level of um, importance that it deserves? Yeah. Um, I, think, uh, I think we've, all the panellists have sort of mentioned um, some different resources and Facebook pages. So I think what we'll do after this is we'll send out, you know, maybe not tonight, but tomorrow um, and the next day, we'll send out an email with a list of those resources because one of, you know, Kate's recommendations in her report is about having employers having a positive obligation to prevent sexual harassment. So really bringing in into that per, um, work health and safety um uh, system um, and you know I won't go on too much on about that now I don't want to speak for you Kate but it, it, it is really it, that is an important um, part of it um, so yeah I, I totally agree with you Connie I'm I'm wondering Erin what do you think what do, how are we how are we shifting this shame well I think I've already covered this but I'll, I'll repeat it you know um, I think calling it out number one if you feel comfortable doing it if you don't have a chat to the girls in your union or male colleagues, it doesn't matter who it is. Um, and the male colleagues ne need to step up and, you know, speak up about this stuff, you know. Um, I think that w one of the things that resonates with me, and it's not just about, you know, sexual harassment or women, it's about, um, and it's a famous quote, but I can't remember who said it and ha how it specifically went, but it was along the lines of, um, though, until things will not change until those who are not affected get involved. Um, and so we see it, you know, in the, you know, we, we see it in the, the black movement where, you know, um, when they went for the vote in America and basically um, tried to cross a bridge, got the shit beaten out of them. And then they went back and then people saw it on national TV and then the white folk got involved. So it was the same sort of atmosphere, you know, we're talking about this here, you know, our shit's not going to change until those people get involved. And, you know, like I said, I hate the fact that I have to say that we need help from the men, but we need help from the men to call that stuff out. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I apologize for swearing so much. I feel That's very okay. That's all right. <laughs> get a dollar from you. I get a dollar from you for each swear word tomorrow. You can buy me a coffee. We broke. Um, <laughs> Uh, or maybe a few coffees, actually. Um, and one of the other things that I was going to mention is, you yeah. know, the reason why I talk about um, the, getting males to call it out is that, you know, what I've seen personally and around the traps um, is that, 
you know, if if a girl calls you out for something, like I'll give you an example, you know, the the toolbox that the the guys have got has a naked picture of a girl in it, and you know, everyone has to use it, including the female, um, and it, it feels, you know, makes some people feel uncomfortable, um, and you know, if if I raised it, they'd be like, oh, you know, bloody women, you know, uh, it, it just you know pussies, or you know, oh, she's on her rags, you know, kick you keep away from her this time or, you know, oh, she's just a feminist, you know, don't listen to her, you know? So when we bring this stuff up, you know, those are the, th those are the current, the, the constant comments that you get. If a man calls it out, it's not the same. Yeah. Straight up. They listen to it like that. And that is disappointing, but it's the truth, you know, yeah. until we see more women in our industry. Um, and I'm talking about 50, 50, which we're going to get there. Uh, but until okay. we see that, you know, they're not going to keep, they're just going to keep ignoring it. Yeah, absolutely. I, and yeah. you know, I, I fully believe that we'll get to 50, 50, um, hopefully more like 60, 40. Um, um, and yeah, so look, I, I think I'm going to end it there with everyone. Thank you so much. It's been um, an absolute pleasure. It's not very often that you get um, somebody who you get the women's officer from Adelaide University, you get the female organizer from the CEPU, you get the federal sex discrimination commissioner, and you get uh, Connie Benares in the Ledge Co in South Australia, a politician coming together to talk about um, their own experiences of sexual harassment, their work, and what, what we're doing about it. So um, I really hope that we have provided kind of a platform for all of the panelists, but also the audience um, to think about um, harassment and assault in a holistic way, but in a way that has um, really made you feel uh, powerful and um, made you want to take action um, and hopefully attend the next Reclaim the Night rally next next October. But of course, there's a lot more that we can do as well. There are SNAP rallies all the time. There's International Women's Day. There is um, There are ways of being an activist in your everyday life um, that you haven't, um, you might not have yet realised. And so hopefully this has given you a bit of a push and you've really enjoyed tonight. So thanks to all the panellists. This has been brilliant. Um, and I hope you have a lovely night. Thank you. Thank you.